Well, welcome everybody. I'm Malcolm Chalmers. I'm the deputy director here at RUSI, uh, and it's my job just to make a, a few housekeeping announcements by way of introduction. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, there is no uh, fire alarm uh, scheduled. Uh, so if it does sound, uh, then it's for real. Uh, and in those, uh, that case, please follow uh, RUSI staff out of the building in an orderly and calm fashion. Uh, second, uh, could you please turn your mobile phones uh, to silent uh, if they are on? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, that would be more, much appreciated. And thirdly, uh, the whole session is on RUSI rules, which means uh, the introductory remarks from uh, Jill and Sir John uh, will be on the record and uh, will indeed uh, be streamed uh, on the RUSI website. Uh, but the Q&A will be off the record <coughs> and uh, off uh, camera. Um, and I'm particularly pleased we've got a pretty full house here today, uh, given uh, the weather. Uh, I was reminded of the, the beast from the east uh, in thinking about uh, this event. Uh, and perhaps it's, uh, it teaches us some lessons uh, it's uh, chilly and big. Uh, it's uh, uh, maybe, maybe quite menacing, uh, but it may not uh, be entirely up to the, the write-up we got uh, two or three days ago in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the extent to which it's exaggerated. I hope uh, this session will, start, will help us to answer many of the questions people have got about Russia today by putting those questions in a broader historical perspective. Are there basic features about how Russia views the world which are continuous and can be traced back for decades? Or how far uh, are some of the things we're seeing today more specific and contingent to this period? Uh, is, uh, uh, can we explain Russian behavior uh, through geographical or cultural or ideological factors, uh, or it's more about personality and tactics. The big debate today about whether Putin is essentially in a long tradition of well, uh, a long-term strategy, or whether uh, what's happened today is more tactical and operational. But as I'm sure Sir John and indeed Jill will explain, uh, this session is not primarily about analyzing uh, the events of today or yesterday or even the last couple of months, it's rather putting those events in a broader context uh, and a very deep understanding both of them have uh, of Russia's place in the world. Uh, Sir John, of course, uh, now a senior partner in Morgan Stanley, a vice chair uh, of uh, RUSI uh, and uh, a whole range of other engagements uh, places him, con continues to place him at the heart of discussions about current uh, UK policy. And he's able to do that from an expert point of view because of a long period of experience at the heart of Whitehall and a whole range of issues, including this issue. But also, I think, usefully, a couple of uh, uh, periods of field work, if you like, field experience in Moscow, both during the Cold War and immediately afterwards, which gives him a particular uh, locus, I think, for commenting uh, on, uh, on those issues. And then Jill, of course, a long uh, and distinguished career at, at an historian of uh, British foreign policy, latterly as official historian in the FCO. And I, I note from her biography that she's in the process of completing a book on the Zinoviev letter. Is that right? So um, interestingly, that issues of Russian interference and fake news uh, are not new features of, uh, uh, of British policy, but I think it reminds us that the British-Russian relation is something which has been a very important element of our uh, foreign policy and security policy for a century and longer, and therefore to analyze where we are now, it's very important to that have that longer term perspective. So without further ado, over to you, Sir John. <coughs> 
Right, well, thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. Just one slight detail. <coughs> I'm a senior advisor at Morgan Stanley. If I was a senior partner, my suit would be more expensive. <laughs> I'm just making, making that point. I'm also looking around, uh, slightly intimidated, just to see what expertise and how much expertise there is in the, um, in the audience. So, you know, I'm certainly conscious um, of, uh, of, of, of that. Uh, right, now the, the theme here is how Russia sees uh, the world uh, now. And I am going to start, and I think Jill will come in quickly, um, from the point of view of the, the natural positioning for somebody from my background, from an intelligence background, is at the end of the day your sort of fundamental objective is to be able to see into the mind of the other side. You know, I sort of always say that. Uh, and that's been my entire professional um, experience. That means that what I'm trying to, be, to, to comment on is I'm not taking political positions, I'm not going to express opinions about the rights and wrongs of different policy positions. I'm just trying to give what I think is an objective uh, analysis of, of, of the way you know, people think um, and decision makers think in Moscow and it's obviously very important to get that right and to understand it. That's historian, for a professional historian, that's just as important. Uh, if you're going to write a good history, you have to understand all the sides of the argument as far as possible. So I've spent a lot of my time looking at how other countries think and includes Russia. So we are absolutely on all fours about that approach. Yeah, so that's a good uh, mutual common start. Uh, <clears throat> and so it's not influenced by political opinions. Uh, but of course, um, certainly in my case, it's influenced by my own sort of personal and professional um, experience. Um, and I'll just very quickly um, list that at some points there because I, I need to just give the context because we're talking a lot about context here. Um, so in my own case, slightly embarrassing in fact to say how far back um, uh, my experience of this issue goes. So I worked in, lived in the Soviet Union in the late 1970s Increasingly, I find that's unusual, people going uh, that far back. Uh, when the Soviet Union was there, nobody was thinking about it ending at all. It just didn't cross anybody's mind or conversation, certainly in my memory. And then uh, I was our service representative there in uh, 1991, October, through to April 1994. The, the, even the months are important because that catches um, the end of the uh, USSR, the formal end, Christmas Day, 91, and it includes the... the Supreme Soviet um, Rebellion and the White House Siege in September and October um, uh, 1993. <clears throat> uh, then, of course, again, professional experience, involvement in the Balkans War. Um, one of my jobs one evening in March 1999 was to tell the local Russian uh, representative that we were about to bomb Belgrade, and it interrupted the dinner. Uh, I'm afraid, I quite remember, clearly remember that. Um, watching the response from uh, Moscow uh, to 9-11, I'll go into that in a bit more detail, um, uh, watching, of course, also the impact of the colour revolutions in 2004, and then through, um, of course, the events in Georgia as they developed up to the Arab Spring in 2011, uh, and the demonstrations in Moscow in late 2011 and 2012. Um, although I had retired by then from the office, it just so happened I made several visits to Moscow at that time, so I had a lot of conversations with some quite interesting people about those events. And then also I'll be sort of just drawing on some public statements. Um, the famous Putin speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, um, his most recent speech at the Valdai Forum in October last year, uh, uh, Sergei Lavrov's speech um, at uh, the Munich Security Conference just the other day, which you know, I heard personally, it's a very grumpy speech. Uh, and then interviews by Nikolai Patrushev and Leonid Reshetnikov, I may just mention briefly at some point, not necessarily initially. Um, now, against that background, let's just make some comments about the evolution of thinking um, on the sort of Russian side through this period. I'm mean, essentially dating things from uh, 1991. Uh, Put it into context. Um, you know, as I saw myself at the time... Uh, in the early 1990s, you know, as far as Russia was concerned, uh, there was a, in, in the immediate sort of collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, there was a formal, semi-formal signing up to Western liberal philosophy and Western liberal democratic uh, model. 
That was the sort of the mood, 92, 93, maybe 94. And then through the 1990s, uh, progressive disillusion with the consequences of that, if you like, uh, political or philosophical policy uh, stance. Much of that was economic, obviously, both in terms of national econ economics, but also in terms of people's personal experience. Anybody who walked up and down the streets of St. Petersburg or Moscow in those days uh, will remember only too well what it was like uh, for individual people um, who just crashed and fell on the hard times for selling off their personal possessions and so on. Um, but, of course, it was also geopolitical. Uh, underlying it all from the beginning, and I do remember thinking this and being aware of it at the time, there was this a fundamental uh, sense of humiliation at the loss, the sudden loss, of superpower uh, status. Uh, up until 1990, you know, equivalent to the United States, and then suddenly a collapse. And we have to remember that you know, when other countries lose empires, obviously, United Kingdom, for example, or France, it happens over a, you know, quite a long period of time, and it gets debated. You have open debates. There's an open society. There was nothing like that in the Soviet Union. It happened very, very quickly. And, of course, it wasn't an open society, so there was no debate until almost the last minute people were being told the, the, supreme, uh, the Soviet Union was the supreme example of human development you know, that the world had ever seen. That was sort of a semi-official line. And then suddenly it was not there anymore, and people were laughing at it. At least that's how it was seen. So society was not prepared for it. And, of course, the other thing, uh, absolutely existential point, that I was sort of semi-aware of, perhaps not enough, was that the impact of the massive loss of territory uh, that was involved in the collapse of the Soviet Union, if you thought of the Soviet Union as being the successor uh, to the Russian um, Empire. And ter territory and defensive territory was just an existential, fundamental point uh, for decision and policymakers, and always have been in... Um, in, uh, in, in Russia, and I remember, in fact, the first analysis I wrote when I went to the uh, embassy in 1976 was um, explaining that you know, Russia and the Soviet Union didn't give up territory, just didn't, end of subject. So forget about the Kurala Islands and Japan and all that kind of thing. You still can, actually, forget about it. But uh, uh, then suddenly, look at the scale of what happened just like that in 1991. Um, then I've already mentioned um, the bombing of Belgrade um, and the Balkans it remains a very sensitive issue. Um, 2001, 2002, the sudden American withdrawal from the ABM Treaty. People forget about that now, but it was a big deal at the time. And it was done in pretty humiliating circumstances for, um, uh, for Putin personally. Um, <clears throat> uh, the color revolutions, of course, through... Um, uh, uh, Medan in 2004 and Georgia 2004. There's a sort of slight feeling at the time, the immediate uh, sort of Moscow reaction to that sort of kept it more or less under control. Um, but of course, subsequently, <laughs> they lost control as they see it. The 2008 NATO enlargement talk, and remember again, uh, there was a, a, a map, a plan put forward for the eventual membership of NATO um, uh, for Ukraine and Georgia. And I think I can honestly say at the time uh, that I, I was overheard referring to that as completely crazy. Um, but nobody took any notice um, at the time. That was the policy position uh, that we had. Uh, then, of course, in 2011, the Arab Springs, uh, hostile, immediate reaction from Moscow was defensive and insecure about the Arab Springs. They were a form of color revolutions. Uh, um, there was particular anger about what happened in Libya. Um, oddly, almost more, although this wouldn't seem logical, uh, than there was about Iraq. Uh, um, and, and Putin even you know, now talks about it in the way he does, but at the time he talked about it very ferociously. Uh, and, um, and, of course, that's the foundation for the Russian policy in uh, Syria today, completely relevant. You know, support for Assad. I don't think our policymakers maybe even now, quite understand how solid uh, that support um, is. And then finally, in 2011, we had the demonstrations. End of 2011, 2012, when Putin was preparing uh, to run uh, for um, his, third, his third term. Uh, and the way the State Department reacted to that and the statements from the State Department particularly, but also the Secretary of State, you know, created the impression, certainly in the minds in, in, in the Kremlin, that this was direct interference um, in Russia's internal affairs by the 
in the United States. That now tends to be seen as a turning point in sort of Russian positioning and Russian thinking. And of course, people interpret what's happened in the 2016 US presidential elections you know, um, in that uh, context. But it follows from what I've just been saying that I would be more inclined to you know, remind people of the way these feelings have been building up from an initial period in, in Putin's terms, even after the dissolution of the 1990s, to try to really have a good and constructive relationship uh, with the US in particular. Um, and then dissolution sort of creeping in and, of course, receiving its first big public expression at Munich in 2007. And to uh, finalise here, um, underlying sort of feelings, if you like, and grievances here um, that I would pick out, there's a fundamental feeling that the West, and particularly the US, applies double standards. So we're all in favour of encouraging Kosovo to split away from uh, Serbia, uh, but you know, absolutely against Crimea splitting away from uh, from uh, from UK Ukraine, and in a confused way, in his most recent Valdai Forum speech, he al he also made a, a comparison between Catalonia and Crimea. Although I'm, I've not entirely sort of been able to understand that um, as an inconsistency in statements and policy making. So commitments made um, at the end of the Cold War not to expand NATO, as you know, that is perceived in any way. Uh, in any case, um, uh, uh, and of course NATO expansion, which is an absolutely fundamental point, comes up time and time and time again. Um, uh, as I think uh, Sergei Lavrov recently said, contrary to the promises made to us in the 1990s, as documents from the US National Archives have recently confirmed, again, NATO continues this eastward expansion. So references back to promises that were made in the 1990s, um, as everybody believes that even though it's actually quite difficult to document the promises. Um, I'm not quite sure what was in the National Archives. Um, interference, um, election and electoral and political interference is hypocritical to criticise them for that because we've been doing it all the time, you know, certainly since the 1990s. That's where probably um, the collapse of the Soviet Union came from. The contribution from Russia generally and the USSR not being recognised. And this was also a feature of the latest Valdai Forum speech where um, you know, we sort of didn't recognise the contribution of the Soviet Union towards the end of the Cold War, and we just then unilaterally declared ourselves as victors in the Cold War. If you want to make people really annoyed in Moscow, talk about being a victor, the West being victor in the uh, Cold War. But also Putin uh, came up with a statement at Valdai that we didn't really recognise and acknowledge that the great beneficiaries of the Russian Revolution in 1917 were actually it was the West and Western society and we didn't recognise the contribution the Russian Revolution uh, made to our, um, our benefit and our development. I've said, final point, after 2012, maybe there's a tendency to exaggerate the sig significance of that as a turning point, um, but um, there is no doubt that since then, things have become much more assertive and policymaking has become much more assertive. Uh, up until February 2014, quite a lot of that was to do with taking advantage of what was perceived to be um, a hesitant US policy and strategic position. As a Russian friend said, uh, they have no strategy. Uh, all, they, all, all the president does is stand up and preaches. And so you could take advantage of that, and you can see that in a number of things that happened. But then, of course, we had Kiev yeah, on the 21st of March uh, uh, 2014, uh, which is clearly a critical turning point. I'll stop there. Jill. <laughs> we decided this was a good place to swap over because what Sir John's been talking about has essentially been the evolution of thinking, but to some extent a great deal of continuity. And he's been talking since 1991 predominantly, and I'm going to talk about predominantly between 1917 and 1991. But really, the continuities are very strong throughout. Now, there are two big provisos here. One is that there is no... By saying that, I do not in any sense mean that this is a continuing Cold War, which is a term that is, is difficult these days, I think. Uh, I don't mean that at all. I don't mean that things haven't changed, because they have changed. But there are certainly strong continuities, and in particular in the way that <coughs> Russia has seen uh, its interlocutors, particularly in the West, ever since the Bolshevik Revolution. 
So I'm just going to do a very quick whistle-stop tour between 1970 and 91 to look at some of those continuities, which really, I think, uh, underline some of the points that Sir John's already made. Obviously, um, whatever uh, Kuti may have recently said about 1917, the West was, generally speaking, absolutely dismayed by uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, not least, of course, because it meant that the Bolsheviks pulled out of the First World War. But between 1917 and 24, I would reckon there's a kind of a readjustment on both sides. Despite an aggressive communism throughout the world, the idea of world revolution, which is being put across from Moscow, nevertheless, uh, there is also recognition that after a revolution, you have to rebuild your economic base. That is the, in the same, indeed, it's the same after the Second World War, and it's indeed it's the same after 1991, and it's a question of how you do it. Now, in parallel with the communist uh, policies being pursued within the Soviet Union in those very early post-revolutionary years is the realization that actually you have to do business with other people, otherwise you're not going to survive. You're not going to be able to sell your grain. And what Russia had and has, despite having lost a lot of territory, is an awful lot of resource, and it's a big country. And actually that's a fundamental question throughout everything we're talking about today. They are a big country, and they want to be treated as a big country. And that was true in the early 1920s and then. But there was a pragmatic realisation, you've actually got to do business with the British, with the French, if possible with the Americans, and indeed throughout the interwar period, despite uh, the ups and downs, breaking off relations, resuming relations, different configurations with different parts of Europe, Essentially, there was a continuing tension between uh, the Soviet government uh, in, in how it dealt with the rest of the world, basically. And that, I think, brings to another general point that I think we ought to underline, which is that we talk about Russia as if it's one thing. Well, it isn't really one thing. I mean, obviously, we have to talk about, as you would with any country, we have to talk about a government's policies. We have to talk about Putin because he's in charge. But that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of tensions within a country, within Russia, as to how individual pieces of policy might be pursued and the kind of tactics you might use in forwarding your strategy. This was true, certainly, in the early revolutionary period. At first, there were a lot of tensions between the Bolshevik Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, and the Politburo itself, and indeed the Comintern, and the propaganda organization. Worth pointing out, really, that ever since 1917, the use of deception, of surprise, of propaganda, of what we would now call fake news, news has always been there. There's nothing new about this. This is a, a recognized tactic of Russian policy. That's not a value, you know, no value judgment here, that's just the okay. case. So actually, my friend Zinoviev, who, as Malcolm said, I've got a book coming out on, would have recognized absolutely fake news, and he would have said, well, that's what you do. This is what we do in order to get what we want. And you have to understand that. Now, obviously, the Second World War makes a huge difference. Initially, of course, uh, you know, we would, we, the West took the view that the Russians clearly were on the wrong side after the Hitler-Stalin agreement, and then, of course, they're invaded, and the uh, Soviet Union becomes a major and, indeed, a critical ally. And at the end of the Second World War, the Soviet view was they had won the war. We thought we won the war. The Americans thought they won the war. Every, all of the three, the big three, thought they had won the war. But from the point of view of the Soviet Union, if the Americans said, we have won the war to make the world safe for American democracy, read capitalism in a way, in Moscow they said, why can't we say we won the war in order to make the world safe for Soviet communism? Uh, so immediately you get a feeling of resentment, of losing out, of being ignored. And a lot of the beginnings of what we now call the Cold War, and I know there's a lot of discussion about when that started, but let's just take a, you know, a basically early, uh, late 40s as the beginning, comes from feeling uh, left out, feeling ignored, feeling pushed back, and feeling under threat from the creeping of 
particularly American economic imperialism. Now, this wasn't something that was just in Russia. Actually, in London, the British government felt pretty much under threat from creeping American economic imperialism. Well, in things like civil aviation, in telecommunications, and in all sorts of other things. But obviously, we were close allies with the Americans. It wasn't the same. So I'm not saying that Soviet policy in the late 40s is, is, is good or bad. We, as John says, we're not here to pass judgment on policies that. But you have to remember, when you're looking at what was going on then, on how it looked. And it certainly did look as if everybody assumed that the world would now become kind of American. Except, of course, it didn't. But in 1991, you're going to get a parallel feeling. This is very simplistic, but we haven't got long, so you, I know you'll understand where I'm coming from. Is that feeling, why is then Russia in 1991, after 1991, expected to become Western? Why is it expected to be transitioning towards a Western form of democracy when that's not necessarily what it wanted to do at all? But it's the assumptions that aroused a great deal of resentment in Russia. Now, the double standards that John spoke about uh, is very much an argument. That's an argument right through from 1917 onwards, uh, when British governments made formal protests towards uh, Soviet representatives in this country about some you know, greater or lesser indignity, and that it's some more blatant uh, uh, action of espionage or propaganda or um, inflaming unrest in parts of the British Empire, which is something that the British government particularly upset about. They said, well, look at what you're doing. You're doing the same kind of thing in parts, edges of Russia. You, of course, after the First World War, also there was the Russian Civil War between, you know, until 1921, which caused enormous resentment, the amount of Allied intervention in the fledgling Soviet Union. Now, rights or wrongs, the, from the perception from Moscow, when you look at the records um, from the Soviet records from the time, is that actually they are a bemused by the assumption in the West that they must want to become like the West, and b the resentment that things that they do are judged by different standards to the things that Western countries do. Right or wrong, that is how things look, and I think. We, the Russian perception that it has been treated unfairly by the West runs through the whole century. And if we're going to understand at all how things are today and how they're going to be possibly in the future, which we're going to talk about in a moment, that basic point has to be accepted. But a final proviso, we mustn't think that things are static. Things have changed enormously since 1991. They've changed in Russia, they've changed in the West, in thinking, in strategy, in the way, in the evolution of European institutions, in the way that multilateral institutions have changed, in the way that even the UN operates. Um, different changes, obviously, John's talked about a lot of these, unrest and so on. But it's, there's a tendency to think that the Russians are kind of stuck in the past where everybody else is moving forward. That's not what we should be thinking about when we're trying to see how Russia sees the world. I'm going to stop there, and we're going to talk about some of the points that have been raised. Uh, right, well, thank you very much. Now, I'm just going to open up in, in a second for um, questions, uh, and, uh, but I'll just pick up a couple of points uh, from that and then maybe highlight the areas of possible um, uh, questions, although we are supposed to discuss a bit, aren't we, as well? <laughs> So um, let's just spend five minutes. Well, I'll, I'll interrupt you if I yeah, feel I need to. Okay, John. well, the <laughs> first one I'd just like to make is to, to support what you're saying about the, the, the use of the term Cold War. Uh, that just carries so many implications uh, and as, a reverse, uh, as a reversion to the past um, that I really feel quite strongly, actually, that we should avoid doing it. Uh, uh, the um, second thing is just a sort of factual thing I, was just, I picked up. Um, uh, Leonid Reshetnikov, who is quite an outspoken sort of guy, um, but is director of the um, <coughs> uh, Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, former um, SVR Lieutenant General, um, he made the point recently in, I think, an interview, Artem Indifacti, uh, that uh, in the Second World War, uh, 
the United States lost 300,000 casualties and uh, the Soviet Union lost 27 million. So if uh, you know, America won the war, well, okay, but let, let's just uh, remember that sort of fact. And that's obviously lots and lots of people know that, uh, that fact. Um, <clears throat> I, I think you know, what comes out, maybe, of what we're both saying is that either implicitly or explicitly, we're talking about, of course, you know, uh, the attitude towards the West, but increasingly, as I read it in recent years, that has meant the United States, focus on the United States. Um, and one of the questions I'd quite like to discuss here, really, is when you read you know, some very critical comments about United States policy, and I mean, it's quite certainly some of them you, know, you can describe as conspiracy theorizing, uh, to what extent do people, serious policy makers and decision makers, really believe that? that the aim I of the United States is to bring Russia down. If I can come on that, I think one thing perhaps we haven't said is that part of the reason that this thinking can develop is because certainly all through the period that we're not going to call, call war, uh, Russia has been a very closed society. And even now, there's a lot of um, control over the media and, and the kind of news that people get. Yep. So in, that's a situation in which conspiracy theories can always flourish. Um, the other thing I, I think that I didn't mention, and, and I think we ought to mention, is the question of China yes, and looking so. towards the East, because that, of course, is a major change uh, in, in more recent... Uh, the world is changing, and there is a global uh, shift towards Asia. I mean, you know... Uh, now, in the post-Second World, world War situation, the Soviet Union was extremely worried about China, Chinese communism, about its relationship with communist China at the time, uh, as a rival, as a threat, uh, the way they were or might not work together, and, and it was a fairly um, up and down relationship. And then after a while, that kind of settled down, because in a sense, the Soviet power did not regard necessarily communist China as any kind of threat to it, and so, so there was a kind of uneasy uh, coexistence, but it was a coexistence rather than a conflict. And now I think uh, the, the element of um, economic threat, of, of, of kind of military rivalry, of power uh, <coughs> rivalry has, is, is rising again. Would you agree with that, John? Well, I'm not sure. I find this a particularly difficult um, area. I remember uh, you know, from when uh, I was there in the early 90s, uh, the sort of consciousness and awareness of sort of Chinese economic power, of course, and, and population power was already building up. Remember the population of the Far East, Dani Vostok, is, was then uh, 10 million in Russia, and across the border there were hundreds of millions of people living. So obviously there's a sense of vulnerability. And the population of the Far East now is 8 million, uh, which, of course, plays into the demographic um, issue. So there is a sort of fundamental thing there. But how much time really seems to be spent in policymaking in Moscow on policy towards China is not very clear. You know, this goes back to the point about the US. Mm -hmm. There seems to be this huge focus now and for the future on the relationship with the US. And, and somehow it's much less clear what the way forward uh, with China seems. Do you think that's, that's, that's because my feeling. the um, American policy seems much less predictable than it used to be? Well, maybe, but... Um, you know, maybe, but uh, the, you know, it was building up when American policy was more predictable. Um, obviously, things are complicated now uh, because uh, things are, have worked out differently from probably what um, had been uh, uh, had been expected. But there's also an awareness that uh, unpredictability in U.S. policy, and there is a certain amount, uh, um, uh, offers opportunities too. And you know, they they, they clearly um, uh, like to take that. But I, I do think that the point about you know, policy and long-term thinking about China is really interesting, and I find it, I find it difficult. I, I met, uh, when I said that, uh, maybe they considered that Chinese policy-making may be more predictable oh, I see. from a Moscow viewpoint than American. I don't know. I'm just yes, but it, there still doesn't necessarily sort of, you know, how do you protect your national mm -hmm. interest in the long run? Um, it does suggest there is a sort of an automatic, almost unconscious sort of Euro transatlantic tilt mm. in thinking um, and this goes into the you know, Asia mm. against Europe 
aspect of mm. traditional thinking. And that's thinking something we haven't really brought up, is this question to what extent Russia still considers itself a European power yeah. or Eurasian power. Could, could you say a bit more about that? Well, you know, theoretically, um, it sees itself as a, a, well, you know, both. Uh, but certainly Eurasia, you know, is, is the big concept from the Eurasian Economic Union is a major policy uh, statement. In fact, Lavrov spoke about that in Munich uh, last week and highlighted the importance of that, you know, and um, President Putin has talked about it consistently ever since he came back to power in 20, 2012 and 2011. In, in effect, it was one of the first things he did was raise that um, issue. Um, but when you look at actual behaviour, the focus seems to be on... Well, the US, as I've said particularly, but also the EU, you know, that becomes, that is also increasingly clear when you look back on what's happened mm. around Ukraine and in the Caucasus and, and so on, uh, worries about the soft power exercised by the EU is clearly uh, there um, as well. Um, and that people in Brussels perhaps took rather a long time to understand that. I mean, the other thing, I think, which we haven't talked about much is the idea of the exercise of Russian power further afield uh, in yes. other parts of the world. And again, going back to the historical side, um, certainly the, uh, particularly in the 60s, for example, when there was quite a lot of Russian act Soviet activity in different parts of the world, in the Middle East, uh, in Africa, and so on. Uh, and that was regarded, um, apart, uh, apart from economic interests, as a counterweight to yep. uh, what was regarded as American power. So, again, Russia is a great power. Russia is a sovereign power. Russia has the right to throw its weight around just as much as the Americans. Um, it, that's well, still I strongly, a factor. Uh, no, I absolutely would uh, support that mm -hmm. um, approach. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the whole of, sort of Russian imperial and Soviet history you know, supports the point that power and state power and respect is exercised through military um, expression, uh, through a territorial um, uh, approach, uh, which plays in, of course, the NATO expansion and all the rest of it. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, also that carries you know, an area of risk, uh, quite clearly, because military power expression can, as we've just been seeing the last few days, quickly translate itself into talk about nuclear weaponry, you know, uh, short-range nuclear weaponry and... Uh, low risk, if you can call it that, nuclear weaponry and so on. So we're, uh, you know, into that area quite, um, into that area quite, uh, quite, well, quite Do quickly. you see that now as paralleled by the Russian deployment to power overseas now? Um, well, I, I think the expression and statements about Russian power, particularly across the Middle East, I mean, there are many ways in which you can explain it. Um, energy, um, obviously, is one very important uh, one in the, um, in, in the wider Middle East. But essentially, uh, it is an expression of Russia's position as a great global power. Yes, I mean, that's something we can uh, probably uh, discuss. We haven't really touched on it, but you know, it is a basic question. Uh, if what we've said is basically well-founded, then what does that mean? What can we expect to happen over the next uh, few years? Um, that's you know, one big question in my mind. The other big question in my mind is that so far, President Putin has been pretty successful, really, um, uh, and you know, has built up his reputation big time as a global strategist and tactician. Uh, but what are the vulnerabilities in, in this position? You know, and perhaps we can discuss that yeah. too, but that's maybe something we should ask questions about. I think we should have some questions, yes. Okay, all right, good. Um, <laughs> right, yep, welcome. <laughs>